Okay. I do what group on discovery or about the main Okay, main thing we can make this in. That's very good. Downloaded the slides, there is a very fresh update. Yes. Okay, so welcome to the uh, call session. I'm Carsten Bormann. With me is Jaime Jimenez. Um, that always happens. <laughs> no, it's the, the Chromebook is uh, acting up. No, doesn't want to do this today. Yes, there are two full screens, and you have to press them in the right order. And what is the right order? No. Ah, much better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm used to, to computers with keyboards, so I don't know how to press these buttons on the screen. Um, yeah, so this is an ITF meeting. We assume people have read the drafts. And you should be aware of the so-called IPR principles and all the other principles that apply. And th these are all summarized in a note well that we no longer seem to get with our uh, materials. I don't know how that works. Uh, but just read this qu slide uh, quickly, and then you will know what applies to you. And in particular, if you know about uh, pattern claims that might apply to something you want to talk about. Um, you can always shut up and not talk us about uh, talk about it, or tell us about it. These are the two uh, choices. Okay, the agenda is a little bit jumbled up at the moment because uh, it's Monday, very early morning in in Europe, and so uh, people have uh, not been submitting things and uh, so on. So we we'll, we'll see how we get through this. So uh, we have reshuffled this a little bit and uh, Jaime will need to check that we do this in the right order. So this order is no longer the right one uh, and we will try to get uh, through things. 
But basically, this is what we want to do today. And given that some people have canceled, we might be able to pull items forward from uh, Thursday. On, and on Thursday, we want to talk about few, a few more active drafts. drafts. We want to talk about uh, the new congestion control draft that we didn't get to in uh, Montreal. Uh, and uh, we could talk about streaming and, and other new work if we um, have time for that. So the, the detailed agenda are, are on the data tracker. Any changes, any other changes we need to make to those? Okay. So um, this slide is empty this time, but maybe we'll find <laughs> more during the week. Um, so let's talk about uh, the work group status for a moment. Our ninth RFC was uh, uh, published in on August 31st. Uh, for me, it already was uh, September, but uh, it still has an August uh, name on it. Um, so that, that's nice. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about the links JSON document that that had left the working group already one and a half years ago, and then got lots of comments uh, from other groups. So this group was comfortable with it, with it but other uh, people weren't. And um, so we we kind of got that back, and took a long while to figure out what we wanted to do. And um, so um, for, for a time, we thought, well, we can refocus this to be a little bit more general. Don't inherit all the limitations of 6690. Um, now, uh, later, we will talk about Coral as another format that's coming up. And that might solve some of the same slot that this one was supposed to fill. Uh, so we have to decide, is, is the gap between what we have in 6690 and uh, what we will have in Coral uh, worth uh, completing this, publishing this? Um, uh, one notable uh, observation is that uh, OCF uh, already have taken much of the content of, of this document, uh, but changed it and adapted it to, to their use. So they wouldn't be able to benefit from, from publishing this because their, their format looks uh, different. Um, so one question we have to decide is, um, is there um, a user that, that would benefit from finishing uh, this? Uh, or do we wait for uh, Coral to uh, complete and uh, become uh, the document of choice for this? Much as I'd really like not to have to actually parse text strings, I'd rather have two things I had to deal with than 15. Okay, th that was Jim Shard. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's one input. And that, that's input that, that many people have, have put in in the hallway. Uh, so th there seems to be a general sentiment to say, okay, um, this this has languished for so so long. Uh, we might as well wait for Coral to uh, complete and and use that uh, instead in this space. So the the main difference is that uh, Coral is really optimized to be uh, used on uh, small devices, and that uh, Coral also can much easier carry additional information that with uh, Links JSON, we still have to somehow fudge into uh, link format style target attributes. Uh, so th th it's a much more flexible way of doing things, but of course, flexibility always has a price. Um, so um, th that's the reason why, why I'm not wholeheartedly saying, Let, let's just do this and uh, be done uh, with it. So we, we don't have to, to make the choice today, of course. Uh, but it, it would be good to to get a sense of the room. And of course, my, my first question is, who in this room actually has read the Coral document? So that's about 10. Um, and who is reasonably happy with it and could imagine 
that we uh, go this way, replace links JSON with Corel. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of half hands here. Uh, so a lot of hands, but uh, uh, some of them half. So yes, we, we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, any other question I should ask at this point? Yeah, probably I should ask, um, if, if Coral is the thing we want to uh, go with, who would be willing to provide reviews of this document? Jim, Ari, Jaime, Matthias, so the usual suspects. Christian. Christian. Good. Okay, so we, we do have some, some support for uh, working on this uh, document. Okay, anything else we want to discuss on this? I would uh, propose to take it to the list from here. So the, the next step for me would be to, to go for working group adoption, uh, to do a working group adoption call for the Coral uh, document, because that's the obvious ne next step if we want to pull this in. Zach, can, can you use the microphone? Zach Shelby, it's, it's a little indirect, like, this might want to use that, thus we should accept the other as a working group document. Probably we should talk about Coral yes. on its own. We should. Okay. So you see some, some need for discussion before we issue a working group adoption call, because the discussion could happen in the working group adoption call as well. Okay, let's have some discussion before that. Good. So this stays on, on the, the back burner and uh, we see if we get Coral adopted and if we do, then, then uh, we seem to have a way forward. If we don't, uh, then we also know that we have to finish this. I see some nodding here, good. So the, the next document that is sitting in the ISG since last year is uh, Coco uh, here. Uh, since this is really a, a, a transport issue, um, so it's bridging between this working group and, and the transport area, uh, Milja volunteered to be the AD here. And uh, we got some great feedback and, and generated a, a new version, Dash 03. Um, and in London, we actually found out there, there seems to be some potential for misunderstanding uh, the document. And uh, sad as it is, I have to report that we still have not resolved this. So we ran out of time in Montreal uh, doing this. And uh, yeah, maybe we can try again this week uh, to, to find out what the problem is so we can uh, ship a Dash 04 and uh, uh, go on uh, from that. But I also want to remind people that COCO is not the only congestion control scheme that ever will be defined for co -op. If you think about TCB, there are a three-digit number of them, and that's not a problem because the congestion control scheme is a local matter. So you implement whatever fits your application best. And um, so uh, th there is next one uh, lined up the phaser work, and we will talk about that uh, on Thursday. Okay, anything? else we want to discuss here in this room now about this. Object security. Um, I think we just said we, we will discuss it on Thursday, um, but uh, just um, a, as a quick uh, status report, uh, this was submitted to the ISG in February. Um, there were uh, a lot of, of useful ISG comments um, and these have led to the main revisions, uh, 11 and 12, and there have been uh, three additional minor updates uh, since, and there will be some discussions this week to see whether we can uh, uh, clear the remaining discussed by Eric Westphala. Is that a fair? Okay, so um, the assumption that, that uh, most people have who, who have looked at this in detail is, uh, we will get it fixed at some point, 
but as with with every piece of security it, it does require a very good look uh, so we are we are, can consider ourselves very happy that uh, we got this detailed look uh, from the isg and uh, can make sure that there aren't even editorial forms of misunderstanding uh, things okay and the fourth document that is in the isg is uh, too many requests Okay, so the too many requests uh, that's in ISC review, it has actually, well, no discusses. Um, all I AD seem to be relatively happy with that, but there's a whole bunch of comments that could be clarified there, small things he here and there. So this is about uh, the 05 is the current version in the data tracker, but then there's also a uh, zero, there's also a <laughs> zero uh, six version, uh, it's upcoming that is in the uh, GitHub that I also pointed out on the mailing list comments. And that, that one is addressing all the comments that we have received so far that didn't make it to the deadline for 05. So key things, uh, some clarifications. Um, number one question that got from the IESG was like, why are we using max age and not defining a new option? And the reason for this is that uh, 503 is already using max age for the purpose of telling the client to back off, come back after this time, and then, then we'll be done. And I guess the reason for 503 to use that initially was that it's the proxy caching rules actually map nicely. So what we did clarify in this draft that we are not defining a new use of MaxH. We're simply reusing whatever was defined for 503. Mm -hmm. And there was one ISC comment that maybe we should also update the uh, INA registry to point out that, okay, also this document is using MaxH to make it more clear for implementers when they see that. But it still seems to be the reasonable way forward that we are using MaxAge. We did discuss it also earlier in the core group, whether we should have a different option for that. So far, the consensus seems to be leaning towards keeping it as MaxAge. On server behavior, uh, what we're clarifying is that the, if the client does not respect the back off from the 429, so the client keeps on doing the same requests, even though there was a MaxAge option telling not to do so, it's now said that, okay, the server may also respond with 503, and the rationale here being that maybe the client simply doesn't recognize the 429 error code. This is a new error code that is now being def defined. The 503 gets the same behavior, but just gives the client much less information what it could do. Then currently there was a that was transport uh, area review saying we may need to do some rate limiting uh, on how often would you answer with this uh, code. So currently the draft says you could, uh, for example, limit to once every RTT, uh, estimated RTT, but um, just discussing here uh, in Bangkok with Karsten that actually such estimates may not be well available uh, for a server, and there could be some other criteria how you want to want rate limit. So now there's a proposal that maybe instead of saying once every RTT, it's just saying taking into account your usual load shedding policies. So whatever you usually are using for this purpose, use also for for this error code, instead of this error code having a specific way of doing that. And there's also a note that in general, when you are doing these kind of things, you are actually making per client state. So if you are doing this kind of uh, uh, procedures, which may be counterproductive for your original goal of reducing load. So that is now noted in the draft. And also there's finally a reminder that this code is meant for uh, to the client that is actually causing the overload. If it's some other clients or some other reason causing overload, the 503 is more appropriate for that use. Just as a note about something that I guess we all know implicitly, but it's good to be explicit on that. On the client behavior, um, there was a question, how do you interpret max age? And like, what is the exact time? When should you start your timer? How long to wait? So Co-op RFC currently says about this max age that it's current at the time of transmission. So there was a offline discussion, what does that actually mean? And we realized, well, it's a bit ambiguous. Uh, maybe a bit more clarifications for this would be useful. So Karsten started this new draft on co-op clarifications and corrections, uh, which could eventually then be clarifying this for all uses of co-op. Because again, this max says is not specific for this draft. So having those details in this draft is made probably not the right thing to do, but having a general clarification draft for that purpose makes more sense. One thing we did clarify here is that the, if the max age is missing, you use the default value as already defined in 7252, 
but just to reiterate that, that those rules do apply. On the security area, especially for the security area review, uh, we added a few clarifications. Again, the first one may be a bit obvious, the COP RFC security considerations apply, but maybe that's a, that's a helpful thing to note there. And then on the trust on the response code. So again, this is nothing specific uh, for this response code, um, but if you are using NOSEC mode, yeah, you cannot trust uh, the responses coming from the right and the right agent, and that would actually mean it could be used as a for DOS. So you should trust the response only to the level you are trusting your underlying security. So if you use TLS, you will you get TLS, get a freshness and and an integrity, for example. But if you have NOSEC, well, you should take that into account. There's a minor um, privacy concern on that um, if you don't use encryption and you do send these replies that could be leaking some form of information, what is the current state of the server, that for example the server is being now currently are under heavy load, didn't seem like a big issue, so we didn't put normative text, but we did note that in the security considerations, if that is a, a concern from some, some kind of deployment. And finally, the security considerations already earlier said that if you are under attack, instead of replying to all of those uh, requests, just simply dropping them could be the right kind of approach. However, the downside of that is the clients are likely to retry. So again, it's a, it's a trade-off to be, to be taken into consideration on the kind of a policy you would apply, whether you drop or, or reply to all of them if, you're, if you consider yourself being under attack. And then final thing, um, so we didn't add anything on this topic to the, to the draft, but again, because it seems to be an issue wider uh, than just this part of our draft, but we got questions on what happens when you're behind a proxy. So if there's a number of clients behind a proxy, they all communicate with the same server. They, in the basic mode, the server, for the server, it seems that all the clients are actually the same clients because it's the proxy, unless, unless you use some additional piece of information. And now when the server replies with too many requests to the proxy, well, the, the last one actually did the request that went over the line will get that reply. And that could have been, for example, the very first request that client made. But it seems there isn't much we can do about that unless you have some extra piece of information. And again, this is a bigger issue than just for this draft. So we are recommending this to be again in the corrections and clarifications draft. That's all. Uh, so that was a recap of all the changes over the past three weeks, roughly. Alexi, speaking as AD, when when are you going to have a new draft, which I can I can approve? Uh, I think. Or do you think you need you know more work discussion on this? I didn't see anyone reacting massively of any of these things, so I, I assume they're all okay, and they were all already discussed on the list. So uh, this was just check if there's no issues. I can press the button today, tomorrow, okay. with the, along the lines of that just presented here. The one thing that has not been on the list was this uh, new proposal, servers would rate limit 429 replies, because that came basically yesterday. So, but that seems to make a lot of sense. It's, just, it's the same thing, slightly more general. It doesn't seem like a controversial thing, so I, I can include that in the next update. Uh, can you go back to the proxy slide? Uh, so Dave Thaler. Uh, so yeah, I think it's probably out of scope for this draft, but we probably need to say something somewhere. Agreed. Uh, and when doing that, another bullet to add to that list of things to cover in the other document that's not this one, whatever that is, um, is what do you do in the case of an HTTP to co-app proxy? You need to specify the role there too. Good point. I wonder what the that proxy RFC currently says probably not enough. <laughs> Fortunately, it's out of scope for this draft. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the um, documents about proxies right now uh, were written uh, with a consideration that we would learn things about proxies as we go along. So they're not at the current moment trying to to nail down everything. So th maybe this is a good opportunity. But let, let me quickly point out the, the reason why this is a little bit more complicated uh, than uh, we like. So th this is trying to be a REST environment. So um, the idea is that the server doesn't keep state about what clients are out there. 
So if the server wants to tell a particular client, you are sending too many requests, that, that's entirely wrong from the point of view of, of REST. Now, in, in a real-world HTTP environment, of course, you would have the TCP connection as a piece of state on, on which you can piggyback uh, something like that. But, but we don't all have that, or at least we don't always have that. And of course, once we have a proxy in there, it becomes worse um, because even if the origin server has the state telling the right client who's overloading uh, them, uh, th there is, uh, we cannot expect the proxy uh, to also keep state about request rates and so on because the proxy has no idea what the server actually is, is able to handle and so on. So it's really hard for the proxy to send back the information that this is uh, too much uh, to the right uh, client. And, and uh, unless we, we, we change the architecture a lot, uh, I don't think there is a good way to fix that. So the inverse observation is that as a nice, well-behaving well client, uh, you might go through a proxy that suddenly sends you a 429 because some other client of that uh, proxy is, is uh, sending too many requests. So that's something that, that the, the nice client has to be prepared uh, to receive. And that, of course, complicates state machines because um, right now, you would expect, as a client, you would expect to get a response. Um, and now you have uh, the, the, the possibility that you get a 429. But you always had a possibility that you got a 503. So it's not that much more of a, uh, a stretch. Yeah, we will talk about the, the corrections clarifications document in a moment. Hi, Ted Lemon. Um, so I was just curious. Um, if you have any sense of how well this is actually working in practice right now? Uh, the use of this uh, response code? Yeah. Not much of it. This is actually a relatively recent thing, uh, but it seems to be, as, especially the OCF guys uh, said they're already implementing something like this. So probably worthwhile asking from them, but it seems to be, the need seems to be there, being something more, better guidance for client than 503. Because 503 pretty much was earlier, you could say like, hey, something went wrong on this side, please back off. Now you have a bit more indications, but uh, let's say operational experience is still pretty low. Okay, thanks. Good, so. Alexey got his answer when we get a new version? Yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. I'll be excited to actually get the document. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had one published in August, right? <laughs> was still in here. So we have one, one other document that is uh, post working group last call. That's the uh, multi-part uh, content type, uh, which is a pretty interesting Swiss army knife uh, tool. And um, one wonders why that hasn't been defined 20 years ago, but uh, um, the answer is probably there was no Seaboard 20 years ago. So uh, Thomas, where's Thomas? Thomas tried to define it five years ago <laughs> and uh, we didn't have SIBO at the time, so we finally have it, so we can do it. Um, Klaus sent a pretty nice review uh, with a ton of editorial comments that uh, we, we uh, have to put in. And two uh, questions that I think are worth um, discussing here. Uh, one is that right now that there are two ways 
of uh, saying something is not present in the uh, set of representations that make up the, the multipart response. Uh, one, of course, is not including anything about it at all. So if, if you don't want to send something, you, you don't put it in. That, that's, of, of course, an, uh, obviously a solution. And the other thing uh, you can do in this version of the draft is uh, you can actually indicate there might have been a text plane something or, or, or an application uh, PDF something, uh, but this uh, something explicitly has a value of null. So that, that's uh, more flexibility for uh, putting in uh, the information that something is not there. So you can say it's not there by not putting it there, or you can say, yes, really, this is not there. Now, why, why is that a good idea? Uh, because applications that make use of uh, a multipart uh, might simply say, I, I expect um, a multipart uh, structure with uh, two uh, entries or with three entries, and the first one is this, the second one is this, and the third one is this. Um, now, if the second and the third one happen to have the same media type, um, and you want to leave out the, sec the second and not the third, um, th that's hard to say without this uh, functionality. Um, but still, the question is, how often do you need something like that? And is it worth uh, complicating uh, this uh, um, structure by allowing a, a null value? And um, we already have taken out some other things from the structure because it was uh, too, too complicated. So this is really a question that uh, we could ask ourselves. Now, I think this, this uh, uh, meshes well with uh, the other um, observation here, uh, which is that uh, the, the current version of the PubSub uh, draft is uh, not yet using uh, multipart CT. We essentially have, have defined multipart CT among others to, to solve the problem for PubSub. And um, the, the document is using this as an example. And for PubSub, it, it might be useful to, to have this null uh, uh, version to say there is nothing new. Um, so, um, yeah, we have a little problem because Michael Costa, who could be talking about the PubSub document, uh, cannot be here because of a medical emergency and he cannot even join remotely uh, to today. He hopes to be back uh, on uh, Thursday. Um, so um, we probably can discuss the PubSub uh, part uh, on Thursday. Uh, but at th this point, I would just like to hear, does anybody have an opinion um, on, on this little piece of uh, complexity? Um, I think that actually, I would say that you don't want that and the right answer may at some point be just to find a content type there isn't anything here instead. Yeah, well that, that's, that, that's different from saying... That's different from saying... There is no there application is, that, PDF that, in that's there That's different today. from saying there's a binary value here and oh, by the way, the binary value is not here. Binary in the sense of one or zero. Uh, uh, binary in the sense of uh, 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 application slash binary. Uh, we call it application slash object stream. But, okay. Uh, whatever. Yes. <laughs> I mean, right. say, say you know, if, if I go in and I say, okay, I've got an application slash ace plus C bore here, and what's there is nothing. That kind of is maybe confusing to some people. Whereas, what if I go in and say, there's a no content type in this slot. That may actually be a better answer in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alexi, I, I think I, I'm not entirely convinced this is needed, but if it's needed, I probably would agree because the current proposal is sort of deviating from MIME. And I know you're not using MIME structure, but you are conceptually using similar thing as a collection, a tree of, you know, body parts and stuff. So, yeah. Keep it simple for now. Maybe do something like what Jim said, you know, later. 
well, th th that raises another interesting question that maybe you can answer, uh, which is, um, let's say a year from now, we decide you want to extend this. Do we do this within the same media type? Is it still a multi-part CT after we have extended it? Or do we do a new media type? Well, it depends on what kind of restrictions you put on the current text, right? Yeah, right now, for instance, th there is one warning in the text that says this might be extended in the future. That doesn't make a difference whether we remove that or we, we leave that in? Well, if you have to extend it, is it going, if the new version going to be backward compatible? Yes. Can the old stuff still read and, you yes. know, possible? Well, then. What I'm saying, if you sort of have extensibility right, then you probably don't need to, okay, to change. If you change the structure, if you decide that you need extra fields which weren't there, well, then it has to be a new mime type because old stuff couldn't parse it, right? right. So you you need a new mime type for text HTML5 because there's stuff in there that that well, text HTML couldn't parse. That's not quite the same <laughs> because it's sort of now let's not go there. That's not a good example, <laughs> probably. Yeah, what, what is a good example? Do, do we have a, a canonical example for media type evolution that we can point to and say, we want to behave like these people? The problem is, for me, you're asking a question which is too general. Yes. And uh, it's hard for me to give you a very general, you know, I cannot t tell you whether, yes, it's all going to be fine or no, it's, you know, I, I think I need to see examples of what kind of extensions you're thinking about. Okay, so let, let, let's um, take exactly this one as an extension, as an example. So let's assume right now the text says that there's always um, um, a binary string there that is the the representation of the part and then we want to extend it to also allow a null value in this place that's not backward compatible now well it's not forward compatible it, it is backward well, compatible. but yes whatever you call it yes so then if, you would if say if you say in the current document saying this value that should be binary value it can be null value which is reserved for future use that would be compatible in the future at least this way you alert that it might be null in the future that would have been okay okay so the next question that we probably will take to, to the list is do we want to say that or not but th that would be something like a middle position between including it or excluding it Thank you. But you know, by the time you you have the discussion, maybe you already decide that you want it or you don't want it. So you know, it might be just a bit easier. Um, hi, uh, Padma Kumar from Nokia. Uh, so this question, uh, at least uh, for me, I'm trying to evaluate whether this means like every time it repeats, this null value could occur, like multiple times that CT is coming up, or is that like a one time? thing because depending on that for example like if you are going to send cbor tlv etc together each of it if it has a null value represented by itself then that could occur in the compacted multiple content type otherwise i think we are trying to override that specific content type what it does or does not represent as a null value right yeah, so um, the, the, the null value would be in place of a representation of the part. And of course, it wouldn't mean th there is, th we have extended the media type by a null value as an additional uh, um, um, possibility, but it would mean that thing isn't there. And if you, if you don't have a way of saying that thing isn't there explicitly, then you cannot always use positional encoding. So an application cannot say that there are four potential things, one, two, three, four, and each of them can be left out. Um, then, of course, in, in an array, you have a problem that when you leave out one, you don't know which one you left out. 
And that was the reason why, why this uh, was original in the proposal. Okay, so that, that doesn't entirely seem to be a slam dunk. I, I was hoping we could uh, just generate a new version and uh, be done with it, but let's uh, find out what we want to do with this on the mailing list. Good. Um, so, what's the time? I cannot see the time. Oh, great. Um, so, we have minus five minutes to talk about uh, two uh, documents. Uh, one is the stateless document that uh, uh, passed uh, working group adoption uh, recently, and uh, we're waiting for the author to uh, resubmit it as a draft uh, IETF. Um, so uh, this represents uh, the result we had of the discussion uh, how to solve the stateless problem, and Sixish is waiting for us to, to resolve that, so we, we don't have all the time in the world uh, of doing this. So of the two uh, ways of doing this uh, we had, mm -hmm. this is the way with potentially a lit lit little bit more uh, impact on the ecosystem. And uh, it also has one open issue that we have to now have to solve in the working group uh, process is um, how do you know whether you are supposed to send a, a 60 kilobyte token or not? Uh, so right now we don't have any any mechanism that would indicate uh, somebody is is uh, able to to accept a token that is longer than eight bytes and and it sounds innocuous if that is twelve bytes, but it, it might be sixty kilobytes and and uh, so we have to think about uh, how to handle uh, this case. Of course, there are other things that can be made big, uh, so it, it's not a completely new problem. But since it's in, in a place of the uh, message format that didn't grow much yet, um, it's maybe something to specifically uh, look at. So, um, who has read this version of the stateless document? One, two, three, four, five. Good. So, um, Maybe you can use this opportunity to say you really should read this document uh, because we are we are actually reaching into the 7252 packet format and, and uh, opening this up a little bit. Um, and uh, if you are if you have an implementation, you probably want to be aware of that. Okay, the other document that that didn't uh, begin work group adoption yet, but but should have maybe. Um, is the corrections and clarifications document. I think we have talked about this in a number of meetings and uh, now finally there, there is an initial draft uh, for it. And uh, the idea is to do the same thing that was done in RFC 4815. Now, of course, most of you won't know RFC 4815. Um, that's another document that has corrections and clarifications in the title. And uh, this was held as a, a running document, as a working document, by the ROC working group for almost five years. And the ROC working group used this draft to, to document minor points of clarification um, and so on, um, plus uh, actual, actually needed corrections, uh, which, which usually also were clarifications, but they, they were clarifications where really a decision had to be made before the clarification could be issued. Um, these were collected in, in the document and this was uh, mostly based on implementer feedback. So we haven't done this in this working group and uh, I consider ourselves lucky that we didn't have to. Um, so ROC is an extremely complicated uh, standard, 170 pages. And um, so uh, it, it does attract bugs when you build something of that complexity and co isn't as complex, but still we have a few things uh, that we want to clarify. And uh, for instance, the meaning of max age was raised by the, the ISG when discussing the too many requests. And th there are some, some details that I think by now we probably can say more about um, than, than uh, we could five years ago. Um, so um, if this becomes a working group document, 
we probably want to cook up a little bit of process how we put entries in there. And we might want to label uh, the entries at some point as a working group consensus if we think the specific clarification or correction issued in there um, no longer has, has open issues. Um, that, that the whole thing, of course, saves us from, from doing another document each time we, we have one of these uh, small uh, issues. So, yeah, I don't know. 4815 has, has uh, um, a large two digit or a small three digit number of issues in it, and we might not get there, but uh, it doesn't make sense to exercise the process um, each time. Uh, so, um, the, the next version of this document might have a draft version of that uh, process. So, if people are interested in, in this, uh, I, I would like to hear uh, from them uh, offline uh, what we might want to uh, put in there. But I think it's, it's pretty much clear what you want to do there. So, you have a candidate issue, then you have an issue with a a proposed resolution, and then at some point you have an issue with, with an accepted a resolution. That that would be three uh, steps, and maybe we have to add a fourth or, or a fifth, um, and, and th that should be about it. And of course, a, an accepted issue might itself have issues that, that have to be fixed uh, afterwards. Okay, who, who has had a look at the this uh, uh, stub document? So two, two people, that's not much. Uh, so maybe some more people want to look at it before we actually uh, get the, the call for working group adoption issued. I just had a very quick look at uh, RFC 7815 uh, and um, that it has sort of list of issues and old text, new text, so it's kind of patch. Yes. Right. Um, from recent experience in ISG, I think it's very hard to review the documents like this. It's much easier to review actually updated document than try to apply a patch, especially if uh, we had a document recently where there were multiple issues and sometimes they were being applied to the same section. So you had to read the most late, latest corrected text uh, to actually figure out what the final text is going to be. If it's if it's all of this is applying to a single document, just publish updated, publish this. Uh, yeah, we don't we probably won't ever publish this. Okay. So well, for, I'm just 4815. If it, it helps the working group to deal with the issues as yeah. a running document, and then once you resolve all of them. You maybe just publish this based on that. I think that's fine. So I think this is just a glorified form of a pull request, um, and uh, that's okay. I think you know uh, I probably can hear uh, several ISG members screaming if you submit a document like this to ISG to yeah. publish. But if it's just internal document in, in the working group, that's fine. So the rock working group just gave up at some point and said we don't have the cycles to do the editorial work to, to put this together. I mean, this was before Git and so on. And RSC 1395 was written in Microsoft Word and it, it was a complicated pro process. So that's why this just was published as a separate document. But I d don't propose that um, we want to uh, do this. Um, it, it might turn into a nice informational document at the end, if we have applied all the things that are really issues and we just have nice explanations, that that might happen. But uh, yes. Um, this was supposed to update only RFC 7252 or the others as well? Um, I think it should, uh, we should use it as a repository for issues for all the, the, nine, is uh, the nine RFCs we have. Um, in particular, there already have been uh, uh, places where it might be useful to do something to 6690. And I'm sure observe blockwise will will have uh, this kind of uh, need for clarifications um, at some point. So if you look at the document, it actually lists some five RFCs it would, it would be updating if it were published. 
uh, but again, that point is not necessarily to publish it in, in uh, this form. And um, yeah, we, we will have uh, five years since the original publication of uh, RFC 7252 next year. So uh, it might be a good thing to actually start uh, this uh, process at some point. But let, let's first collect the things that we actually want to change and uh, see how, how heavyweight that is. Okay. Um, yeah, the next item on the agenda is OSCOR. As, as I said, we are going to talk about the, the base document on Thursday after some more hallway discussions. And uh, now we will talk about the group communication parts. Okay, uh, Marco Tiloka from RISE. Uh, a quick update on OSCOR for group communication. Uh, we have a major revision of the document, mostly based on two detailed reviews from Jim and Peter. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, of course, all of the editorial changes, mostly to improve readability and have a better alignment with the main uh, OSCOR document. And upon many people's requests, uh, we moved every detail on key management, key provisioning aspects out of this document and to uh, the related document uh, in ACE that we refer here. Uh, we keep in this document only um, high-level pointers and, and discussion on the importance of that, especially uh, the group manager as the only responsible for uh, key provisioning and handling key material in the group and acting as repository for uh, public keys uh, of group members. But again, the details are moved out to the ACE document. Uh, we have also now two uh, proper separated sections for the cozy object and the other compression, again, on the editorial side, while um, a big technical update is uh, the counter signature. It used to be placed uh, inside the OSCORE option. Now it has been moved out and appended to the payload uh, of the secure message. And this has the advantage to uh, achieve well, um, more affordable impact in terms of uh, message fragmentation was that it's just possible to easier parse the, the OSCORE option, retrieve the context uh, and then proceed. Uh, we added some more text on security considerations that we actually plan to extend further. Uh, so, for the time being, mostly on management on group key material and possible misalignment of security contexts uh, among group members right after a uh, new key material has been distributed in the group and how to handle that. Uh, other aspects handle what happens if um, you experience wrap around of sequence numbers by group members and use the as partial IDs and how to handle that. Uh, we have compressed the the list of responsibilities of the group manager. Now a single one used to be two lists. Uh, pointed out explicitly the need for registering uh, the bit in your score option to signal the presence of the signature uh, that is actually defined in this document. And we have rewrote, uh, I would say from scratch, a massively shortened appendix uh, D describing at a very high level the setup of a new item point. Because uh, again, everything related to uh, the provisioning of key material to a new endpoint is out of scope for this document and described in the ACE one. Um, as the next steps, we would like to converge to a, an actual implementation version of this document. We believe we are uh, pretty much there actually, because uh, as co-authors at least we don't see any big issue left uh, that will stop an implementation of this spec. Uh, we just like to uh, better define what aspects are uh, exactly up to application policy, like uh, how to handle transmission of error messages back to uh, group members if something is wrong. And uh, we would like to expand further the security considerations, hopefully as a one-to-one -one, uh, match with the respective subsections in the main score document. Uh, speaking of implementation, uh, in RISE we are going to start soon implementation for Californium, uh, building on the current one available for our score. And Osram Innovation is also planned to start soon uh, an implementation in C. Uh, I was also to be used specifically for the dot dot framework. Uh, of course, if anyone else is interested in considering this spec for uh, implementing, you're very welcome. And that was it for the update. What's the next step? Converging or maybe even agreeing on this very version to say, let's start implementing this towards interop next year. And we are actually 
we have actually two implementations scheduled to start soon. So more are welcome. So, how will this uh, intro be, be organized? Do you have an idea about that? N not yet, honestly. Okay. So in detail. But we can start remotely with something very friendly to bring something more concrete here uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it, it would be good to, to have something like like a timeline uh, for for this next year. It's, it's nice, but next year might be December. No. <laughs> So what's your best guess when, when that intro will be? I hope we can have an actual one uh, in summer meeting. We'll try to have something already testable okay. earlier. Good. If possible, yeah. Thank you. OK, we'll proceed with the next one. OK, uh, Mark De Luca from RISE again. Uh, this is a related work that we started uh, after some uh, discussion at the mic on group of score uh, in Montreal, actually, uh, where some were wondering, uh, is there any other work, especially in this working group, that somehow uses groups and can be helpful in any way to group of score? And we talked about the possible use of the resource directory for that, so to facilitate applications uh, using security and based on groups. Uh, we tried to elaborate the story a little bit more and talked about a, new, a newly deployed device that eventually gets an operational identity to, to, to run its group application. But uh, even at that point in time, that identity might still lack uh, a number of information that are uh, operatively required to uh, to work in a secure group. For instance, the identifier of the group, the, the, the IP addresses used in the group, multicast IP addresses, uh, or specifically the link to a joint resource of the group manager to get access to the group and at that point in time also get the key material to operate in the group. Uh, and this can actually happen for a number of reasons like even the manufacturing time and there's just not such available information to provide uh, to, to the joining node or the information that uh, the joining node required to operate in the group uh, has changed right before the device deployment or extreme case uh, the device is deployed even before the group manager is deployed or before the group manager has created the group that the device would like to join. So we try to find a way to use essentially the core resource directory for uh, a joint device to uh, possibly find the existence of the OSCORE group in the first place and to retrieve all the missing required information to join that group through the responsible uh, group manager. And we actually use resource lookup uh, of the resource directory because uh, in the end, the joint device needs to uh, retrieve the pointer and a link to the joint resource of the group manager to uh, access the group and get the key material to securely operate uh, in the group. Uh, we try to be general, but we had a, as a guideline the method described uh, in the ACE draft referred here. So of course, we are consistent with that, first and foremost. Um, it works like that pretty much uh, as a steps order in time. The group manager uh, sooner or later is supposed to register itself as an endpoint in the resource directory uh, and at the same time to register uh, all its uh, joint resources with the related link attributes. And we are referring also to a new value for a uh, resource type, uh, OSJ, to be considered for the core parameters uh, registry. So in this example, uh, essentially the group manager register, registers itself and one of its uh, general resource with additional information. Later on, it might happen that uh, the group manager creates uh, new score groups or for some reason it has to update some information related to uh, those groups. And of course it has to update the entries related to those joint resources. And one way to do that is that the group manager re-registers uh, itself uh, an alternative way would be somehow using fetch or patch, but that of course would require the proper definition of uh, format for that. Uh, and then later on, uh, the device can perform a resource lookup at the resource directory, uh, specifying a number of search criteria, of which uh, resource type OSJ is mandatory and other are uh, possibly uh, usable in addition, like uh, the identifier of the score group or the identifier of the group manager registered as an endpoint in the RD, and the journey not gets back as a reply. Uh, all the information it needs to contact the group manager and join the group. And already in this example, I highlighted the possible, of course, optional use of observation for this uh, request. 
which has a number of advantages like, of course, automatic notification in case one of this information uh, is updated later on, or even for the extreme case where uh, the joining node is deployed uh, even before the group manager is deployed or the group is created. And so only later on when the group uh, is created and all the related information is fully available, uh, they can be provided to uh, the observer response uh, to the joining node. Uh, of course, if you do like that, you can produce a response to observer with quite a large payload if there are so many joint resources uh, for that group manager. So uh, it's actually recommended to use uh, observe here in this request only if the lookup is fine grained, meaning if you have the identifier of the group also uh, used as the as search criteria. Uh, very next steps is, of course, getting feedback and comment on this uh, new work, and of course, align it to possible upcoming changes to the main to the main resource directory document. That's it. Uh, Jim Schott, um, I haven't read this document. I probably obviously need to. Um, one of the things that we're talking about in terms of the resource directory is to get rid of uh, the concept of groups. Does that kill you or not? It's the same for this document at this point in time. In fact, we use only resource lookup. Okay. And we don't care about what happens to the groups in the RD as they are now, Okay. from the perspective of this document. <laughs> Peter van der Stock to react to that. If we remain with the old groups as specified in the resource directory, it will work as well. And we have go done and going forward to the next one, which is more appropriate because it uses resources. And so that will be work better. It will be much more. But of course, we have to say that we must have more experience in how we install things to see if it's actually the right approach. Okay. Hi, uh, Padma Kumar from Nokia. Uh, Somewhere, I'm probably layman in terms of both Oscar and this group uh, drafts. But uh, in terms of object security and then the group communication at a device level, probably doesn't uh, seem to be one is on the object security level, whereas this is a this happens entirely before, of course, the communication between the joining node and the resource directory is to be secure just as described in the resource directory document. Then what happens later on in the group is out of scope for this document. Okay, okay. So it comes up, that still happened. And then the other question I had was like, uh, the uh, right now I'm looking at RD and lightweight M2M server as an equivalence, uh, like we were discussing. So in terms of this uh, group server, or group manager, yeah. uh, can it also be an RD? So then it kind of gels well with the management. We haven't considered that, at least from my experience, they are treated separately, uh, at least from a logical point of view. I wouldn't exclude that. <laughs> maybe, just to clarify, uh, maybe it's not so uh, connected with Live Within to m server right now, this particular draft. Yes. Uh, Matthias Kovac, Siemens. So I was under the impression that RD uh, became more modular so that you can um, provide extensions that provide, for instance, new forms of lookups. Um, you are using explicitly the existing resource lookup to then yeah, point to the resource to get the information. I just wanted to confirm this kind of dynamic that we had discussing about RD, making a bit modular, um, kind of plugging in more mechanisms that use the existing resource discovery mechanism by <sighs> having the, the right target attributes. And the group could be one of those extensions that you basically plug into your resource directory. Is that, does that hold or? Uh, it's not using this version. We are ready for a possible update in the end towards this direction. Depends on what happens in the RD document. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically, um, Yes, the, the resource directory is uh, meant to be modular, but isn't it great when, when the base functionality actually already works for us? I mean, not having to extend it is, is a good thing. So uh, from Jabber, Christian says uh, at Matthias, can we have the, the group's discussion on RD after my presentation? Yes. <laughs> okay, so who has who has uh, read 
this document or version of this document. Um, Peter is. Uh, yeah, okay, co authors, uh, I hope. Uh, maybe that's uh, misplaced hope, but uh, generally should have read the, the, the document. But anybody else? So I, I take this as the, the uh, place where you have been alerted that there is an interesting document out there. And uh, I think this is great work. Uh, and uh, I, I would love to get some, some reviews of this. OK. Did you want to talk about the, the other two security documents, the, the echo request tag and the actuators document as well? No? Oh, I think I know. Not co-author and not and so on. So, is there anybody here who, who wanted to do that? Because I don't have slides from anyone. <clears throat> so, did anybody want to discuss echo request tag and uh, actuators? Okay, uh, Jim what wants to. It. It. I just. Um, is, are, are we, there was a, a, we're about ready to work in group last call echo. Is, is it, that going to happen now? That's a good question. So, so who has read, um, version 03 of the echo request tag document? Jim has. So we will get one response to the version last call. Oh, Jim has read it too. Yeah. So, um. Um, I think we can issue a working class call because the document is, is fundamentally uh, ready. Um, but we have to make sure that we actually get useful uh, replies from that. So let me just ask, uh, if we issue a working class call now, who will send in comments? Jim, Jaime, Francesca. There's one hand. Alex, thank you. Okay. Good. So I think we should do that uh, next. Now, on the actuators document, I think we have had a little bit of a different perception of what this is. Is this uh, an admonition to implementers, which, which would make it like an AWIG document? Is it some some text we may at one point add to ROC 7252 to clarify that, that you have to be a bit careful how you use these primitives. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the correct disposition of this is. Of course, we could just publish it as another informational RFC, um, <clears throat> but um, that, that may not be the best place to make sure that the people actually uh, read this document. So I'm, I'm a bit unsure what to do with it. I mean, it, it's very useful information, but uh, what should we do with it? OK, the answer is people are leaving the room. Um, OK, maybe we need, also need to take that uh, to the list. Um, so um, I shuffled around the agenda a little bit, but maybe uh, we actually should unshuffle this. Um, because we just ran into the resource directory uh, issue, and maybe we can can relatively quickly go uh, through that. Um, so I think the the idea would be to do the resource directory part now, and then go to to the the next parts. Um, resource directory. So uh, Christian, are you out there somewhere? Can you press the red button? Uh, why doesn't that work? Oh, it's okay. Christian, you should have the mic now. Uh, hello, working group. Um, hello, you are nice and loud. I'd like to talk about the resource directory and especially its status since the last um, ITF meeting. Uh, so there are two big things that have come up here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing is that we finally um, received a review on the topic of the modernized link format, thanks to Klaus, um, which indicates that we should, um, to quote, um, 
um, would probably not want to do that. Uh, the other is the topic of groups, which has already been introduced um, in the questions to Marco. Um, but we, before we get to those, I'd like to give a short update of of what hap what has happened. Um, slide, please. So there's a, the, the security policies have been updated, um, responding to some comments that we got. There was a successful plug test, although um, there are still issues with the universe, uh, universal deployment of IPv6, so we couldn't test all the, the working clients against each other. Um, but what we could test uh, did largely work, but resulted in some good comments, which have been, which are either under processing or have been incorporated as editorial changes. Now, all those changes wound up in a Dash 16 version. Um, you might have noticed that there's also a Dash 17 version, um, which which includes the later changes to the group. But um, as I see, the slides are the other way around. So in slide, please, um, let's start with the uh, topic of modernized link forward. Um, what we tried to do with modernized link format was to work around the limitations of 6690 by doing what you could describe as a 6690 bis in an appendix. Um, now that didn't go too well with the reviews. So we are moving back a little now to saying that there is a limited subset of 6690 links, which is which should work with what people have implemented and prescribe that only those for the, only for those um, um, data sets, the resource directory can can work with link format. Um, now, as for the for the implementations, I've gone through uh, almost a dozen implementations of co-op or the or link format, and none of them do the bad things we are trying to work around from 6690. So um, hmm. it, it seemed to be fair to to do a bis, but the sentiment seems to be that 6690 is not fully the way to continue anyway, given what is um, what we'll we'll hear in the next presentation on on links JSON. So defining a limited subset with which everyone can work uh, seems to be the, the good way forward here. That does preclude uh, some particular applications, especially the one that uh, Matthias um, asked for in the, in the London meeting, which is about um, endpoints that have a path prefix. Now those can't work with that kind of links, but those applications can still either use coral or any other link format that's not um, inheriting the 6690 problems or rely on the implementation to work with those links that are outside of of what the resource directory specification actually says is is okay now the other topic uh, slide please is groups now groups have been in the resource directory uh, do you still hear me yes we do. okay okay Thank you. Um, groups have been in the resource directory for for about five years, and what came up in the discussion also with with Marco and trying to um, to work on a on a concrete application of groups is that what those groups do is not actually what you need to deploy a group because back then it seems to me the impression was that a resource directory could just publish a list of endpoints and though to be part of a group and they would automatically join. Now joining is a bit more complicated now that we expect everything to run over crypto. So there is not much value anymore in enumerating the membership. And um, also that, that part of resource directory added quite a bit to com its complexity. So it was maybe 10% of, of the whole document length. So what I'm trying to do with this this group proposal is to say that groups are not a groups are not a thing as an as a separate entity in resource directory, basically ripping out those ten percent, um, but introducing a way of registering a group as an endpoint. Now this is something that doesn't need any complexity on the on the implementation side because it's just an endpoint just with a particular attribute which it already have had. Uh, next slide, please. This also means that we can now uh, look up groups, uh, look up resources of groups, which is something um, Marco hinted to in, um, in the in the group application for Oscar as well. Um, yeah, and 
as it would always have been, a group is registered by a commissioning tool that knows all the details of the groups. Now that would in practice often be the uh, next slide, please. That would in practice always uh, often be the group manager that knows what the details of that group are. Uh, so in the dash 17 draft, um, this, the old groups got replaced with a, basically an appendix that says, this is a way how you can use groups. This is a usage, this is a usage pattern for which we also define a, an endpoint, um, an endpoint type. So it is well-defined, but it's rather simple, straightforward, and hopefully something, um, the working group will not object to, um, this late in the process, given that we are already trying to, to move towards a working group last call. Um, now one reason why this was done is that implementers usually didn't implement oh, there there was exactly one implementation um by jim that that implemented those groups as they were and this means that we can't really present much inter um interoperability experience with those groups whereas the the new groups are um are something you can do with any resource directory uh, next slide, please. So as, um, as, um, to the point of, of what, how can resource directory progress now, there are two concrete questions I'd like to ask. One is, um, does anyone use all the, all the details of RFC 6690 in particular, um, the, the origin resolution rules, because, um, if so, we might need to prescribe that an R, that an RD even process those correctly, which I think we don't need to, making implementations way simpler. Um, and the other question is, are there any applications we did not hear before of the groups that were in the personal dash five draft up until dash 16? If the answers to both questions are no, I think we can um, possibly by the next interim meeting publish a version a draft version that can go into working group last call. But of course, I'd like to hear the working group opinions on, on all of those topics. So Zach Shelby from ARM. Uh, thanks, Christian. Really good presentation and um, good work to re <coughs> reduce the size of a draft going into working group last call. That doesn't happen often. Um, just, just my insight onto both of these. I mean, the reason we added groups as they were back then was because of Peter. It was, it was you know, in the lighting industry, this was seen as a necessary tool for installation management um, tooling, and, and so it was really just based on a very clear industry request. Now, this is a neat way of solving the same problem with less mechanics, you know, nobody ended up implementing that group thing because a lot of RDs that are deployed today on the internet are centralized cloud thingies. They're not available <clears throat> available locally for this type of group communications. So I haven't seen a lot of RD um, deployments at the edge. Um, that could change and that's fine because I think this, this new mechanism is, is okay. On the first question, I'm not aware of people doing advanced um, 6690 work. I haven't seen that in the wild. Um, so I think it's safe to say we could we could simplify it and dumb it down um, for this. And then let's see in the future what happens with Coral. One thing I do think we have to be aware of is future compatibility with new link formats in this. Just, just double check that we don't, we don't get caught with Coral coming and then not being able to use it. Thank you. I think we can take care of the coral compatibility. Um, Matthias Kovac, Siemens. Um, so I tried to catch up kind of the, the exact issues with RFC 6690, and I couldn't find actually explicit text that redefines the URI resolution mechanism or that you should do it in a different way. I think there was just an explanation missing that people who are not aware of the actual algorithm do it right. So. I'm not sure kind of what happened. I tried to figure it out from the mailing list, but but I'm a bit lost there. Is there really a feature that people wanted to use? I, I think it's more a bug where text is missing. Um, well, um, it's it's not particularly about the, the URI resolution itself. So, so 396 stands, 
but um, 6690 says that, for example, before you resolve the, the href links, you have to first resolve the anchor and then resolve the references in the href relative to what that anchor uh, resolved to. And in between, uh, at some times in between, you have to form the origin of that. So you strip all the path components. That's something that technically is not part of the URI resolution, but part of the resolution that happens before um, before the URIs are resolved. Yeah, so so in particular, I, I think uh, it, it's only broken if you use relative URIs upon registration, but I never saw that, that anyone does the relative unless there's a bug in the application or whoever does it. Well, it, it, it turns out, as, um, it, it appears as a bug when you have a relative reference um, and there's a, an absolute anchor. And that, that's one of the two issues. And the other issue um, is with applications that, um, well, when you register the resource directory, you should register relative references because otherwise you can't use the upcoming critical negotiation um, topics. But if you want to have a path in, uh, as your base, for example, in the um, in the applications you presented, where you'd have a gateway that registers parts of what what it is forwarding as individual endpoints, then that's that resolutions. Then that pre-resolution step of stripping the base URI down to its origin would bite you. Okay, I think now I understood this kind of very indirect way where it it breaks together. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe I can just add that that um, one of the original ideas was that you can put your link format text into ROM um, by using relative references. And um, well, that, that's for uh, use in Wayne on core, uh, but we have the simple registration mechanism where the resource directory then fetches the Wayne on core and constructs the registration uh, out of that. So that's why relative references sometimes do occur, and, and uh, we should make sure that uh, we can say where they work and where they don't. Peter van der Stock, to go back to the former topic, I have had uh, feedback from my from the electric from the lighting community, and they have no objections to this new type of uh, using the groups. Okay, fine. Thank you. So probably the is this working at all? Um, probably the the next step is to to ask exactly these questions on the mailing list once more, and uh, uh, wait for a week and then issue the working class call. Will do. Good. So thank you, Christian. Thank you. And then we have uh, RDD and SSD. Could have used this one all the time. Thank you. Okay, this is a very uh, small update on the RDD and SSD draft. Uh, what we have done is added a section in the beginning of the RDD and SSD draft, which motivates actually the mapping which goes on from the resources to the uh, services. So one of the things that one has to find is the DNS domain in which the resource, the resource holding, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, oh, how's this called? host, uh, which domain it is, and there is a new um, a draft which has been done, uh, so we, that tells you how you can actually find the domain of your uh, node uh, where, uh, the, which you have, at which the software is running. So that is then solved. 
the service type, uh, we have discussed that actually the resource type and the service type actually serve the same functionality because there are services delivered and you want to service of a typical functionality you want to discover. And that is uh, what you want to do both with the resource type and the service type, where the service type actually may envelop several uh, resources within, with different resource types, which can be then uh, uh, put together in, an, uh, in one type of resource type. So that motivates that. And then further, the instance. Uh, the instance can be a manufacturer-generated name. Uh, so like I have my Hewlett Packard uh, um, a printer, and I may have Hewlett Packard 1 and 2 or 3 within my local domain. And so you can do it like that. Or you can be more general. You say, look here, let's be very absolutely certain that we have no misunderstandings and prefix uh, use the UUID, which is supposed to be rather uh, uh, Identi uh, uh, identify the, uh, the the instance of the service, or what you can do that you have an interface description and you describe in it how you actually find the attribute for the instance, or you can during deployment uh, find using commissioning to it tells you look here your number five hundred fifty five in the left hand corner. So these are the, the different examples that we put in the instance and together with the domain service type and the instance, the service type uh, for used in the DNS is completely defined. So that is what we, uh, how our, uh, what we have done up to now. If there are any comments on this approach, uh, please let me know. It makes the, it makes the thing more flexible and it gives an explanation how you can actually adapt it to your own uh, circumstances. There is one suggestion uh, that everyone may have an, uh, in the YANA registry, which automatically maps the service type to the resource type. I don't know if this is a good idea. I should like to have some reactions about that if people think it is good, but or that we just keep the service type registry and the resource type registry, and we do not care about a uh, fixed uh, uh, mapping. Ted Lemon. Um, so the, the mapping problem is actually a really big problem and um, having a registry would be nice. I'm not sure that, that having a registry of mappings is the first step. Um, the first step I would think would be having a registry of, of names that you might map. <laughs> um, there is a service type uh, registry. No, no, I don't mean, I don't mean, are, are you talking about the DNSSD service type registry? Yeah, no, no. What I mean is that the, the, the things that can appear in core RD are not enumerated. And therefore, defining a mapping between them and uh, DNSSD service types is is problematic. Uh, so, and and this is a problem that exists because there are about fifteen different standards bodies defining their own different ways of of, of doing these things. And uh, you know, this is something the IAB actually did a report on recently. Um, we we kind of need to solve that problem if we're going to do this. Um, and I don't know how to solve that problem. So that's there is a resource type registry. That has about 200 something yeah. Who's who, uh, where are you talking about a, a core RD resource type? Yes, yes. Okay, and that's being is, is are the are people like dot dot and and those guys uh, dot 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 yet most of the uh, entries are from uh, OCF and I think a few from Broadband Forum. Okay. So um, so there's a start. Uh, do you, I mean do you, do you get the sense that that the other the other SDOs that are working on this are uh, interested in participating in that or is this just OCF and, and, and BBF? Well, it's a registry, so it, it's not really hard to participate. I mean, you can to yes, but, but and, uh, the, problem, the problem is right now it sort of feels like there's a tendency to try to keep this stuff um, proprietary or, or within the, within the, the SDO uh, so that only members can use it and, and that creates an interop problem for us. Dave has some experience with this process. Uh, Dave Taylor, I can only answer half of one of your questions. <coughs> um, uh, OCF has a policy to register all their resource types with IANA. Right? There's no intent to keep any of them private. In fact, it's part of their requirement before they publish a standard is they make sure everything's in IANA before they publish their document when it, as, as the final copy. Um, now, uh, you'd ask about other organizations, and I can't come on on them. Um, and so the OCF wants everything to be in the INI resource type registry. What I can't comment on is whether OCF cares about the service type mapping. I have no idea. Um, 
And uh, mapping a service type to a resource type is actually the easier direction. The opposite direction is much harder because resource types can be arbitrary URLs, not just the things that are in the registry. Mapping the things that are in the registry is very straightforward, but mapping arbitrary resource types, and so maybe in the proxy you say, uh, or the, the, the map or whatever, you say, I choose to not register any of the, and not make those be discoverable in DNS. That's why that one's a much harder problem. So anyway, I think I answered half of one of your questions. So. <laughs> Um, another solution is uh, that actually we define a parameter which is called st is, so that for each node it is defined what his uh, service type is, and so we have no mapping, nothing else. It is the one who installs the node who actually knows what the or the manufacturer who knows what the service type should be. Yeah. I think we, we come up with this interesting problem that we have uh, two, three, four registries defining essentially but not entirely the same thing. We don't have a good process in, in the IETF to, to merge registries. Uh, so maybe there is a more fundamental problem lurking uh, there. Uh, so one other point to add, this is Dave Taylor again. Uh, if, Ted, if you're not familiar with the resource type registry, uh, the syntax in resource type registries allows things like dots which makes it complicated to map it into service types, not the other way around. So that's just another example of, uh, if you look at all the ones, you know, the, the 200 or whatever that are registered, the vast majority of them have a bunch of dots in them. Sorry, I have had some comments, thank you very much. I really hope, looking forward to some more comments and push this forward. Okay, thank you very much. Don't go away. Hmm? Don't go away. So th this finishes the, the uh, resource directory um, segment. Um, I think we... Yeah, but you will need to use in a second. Um, so um, I think we can skip forward to the call conf uh, uh, item on the agenda uh, at this point. Um, and uh, Peter is the next one on the agenda. So thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> skip, skip, skip some more. Oh, okay. yes, this is me. Yeah. OK. Um, I've run into a problem with uh, registration of SIDs. To your mind, Bear, we have the contents of a Young specification can be transported over constraint networks. Uh, we have then the Young to Cibor uh, uh, draft, which tells you how this Young is converted into Cibor, which makes it smaller. However, the Young names can be very long, so you're still uh, left with a very, very large payload. So what we have, what has been done is that the young names can be uh, reduced to numeric identifier called a SID. Uh, for example, in our case, uh, where we, young is usually used to define uh, uh, observables in an, uh, in an, uh, in, in a node so that you can read how the node is doing. What we have done, for example, is specified the voucher, which is transported over the network, specified it in young. And so the CBER plus the identifier, the SIDs are transported over that. Uh, now, one of the things that we want is once you have defined an RFC that the SIDs you have that have been allocated to, to the youngs, which are part of the young module, which is part of the RFC, should not change. And um, that's what we want. We don't want to change it. For at this moment, the SID ranges, the SID ranges allocated to modules from a comb space facility. And they can be changed during the development if you need be. If you don't want to change them, you don't change them. But suppose you change your whole draft or another draft, etc. So you can change them so you have all this freedom. Once the RFC, you, the ID is ready to go to RFC, uh, you go to the YANA, you get an RFC range, which is uh, which is, can be fragmented in short ranges, which are supposed not to change anymore, which are allocated to the modules in the RFCs. Fine. Uh, now, what we have now that the it's not clear how within this uh, within the RFC the SIDs should be uh, 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 registered and administrated. So this is what we uh, propose: that once you have a SID range for every module in the RFC, 
that the contents of the SID files, which are this diary, which actually specify this is the young name and this is the SID file, that that is part of the uh, of the RFC. Just like the same as you have now that the whole young uh, specification uh, is part of the RFC, and also how, for example, the tree uh, which you have, which is uh, specif which is co constructed, is part of the RFC. So we want to include that as well. What we also then want that apart from that the module you normally is registered by Jana, which tells you how, how what what is in it, that uh, also the SID range is administrated by Jana. So that we can also then say find that uh, for every module which is in the R is in the RFC, we find uh, the name to SIDS uh, map, which is part and which will not be changed and is actually on the responsibility of Jana. You want to say something? Yes, do you want some answers or some questions right now or at the end of the presentation? Uh, if you can wait a second, I will be okay. happy. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so what we then will ask for uh, Jana is to provide an extension to the Young Parameter Registry. In this Young Parameter Registry, we also find, we already find a module sub-registry. And so the suggestion is to create an additional SIT module uh, sub-registry in which is mentioned the SIT file where in which you can find then all the uh, administrated young names and the SIT, uh, the SIT which converge with that. So that I will feel reasonably happy that this will remain constant and over the years can be used and reused. Okay, so... Uh, Alexander on the mic. Thanks very much for, for your email and for, for this presentation, Peter. So this is completely in line with uh, what the Kami space and the whole thing, the whole system that it uh, it was supposed to work. Right, once you assign, uh, uh, and I think Karsten pitched in on the mailing list, once you assign a, a, a SID, then it never changes. And of course, uh, this uh, we, we talked to Ayana a couple of times, and this is really something in, in, in the in the way things should be working. So uh, I really like what you said here because we really need to specify like some in, in some places if the process is not specific enough, then we need to go and, and, and make sure that it is actually written in a way that works for people that are actually using it. So that does seem to me to be like, yes, this is in the way, at, at least in how I felt it, it goes exactly in that direction. And it just in, this, in 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 like okay well there is maybe something that was not explicit, let's make it explicit, yeah, yeah. yeah because we have looked at what was written down, and we didn't exactly know, so that's our brains came up with this. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, Stay sure. near the microphone. So okay. <clears throat> of course uh, we we are the German phrase would be Rechnung oder den Wert machen. We we are trying to to. Uh, uh, compute the, the um, bill without the, the uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, um, of course, IANA has to be happy with doing this. Uh, I mean, given that there will be hundreds of, of uh, modules with hundreds of names in it, so essentially this registry will in the end have 10,000, 100,000 uh, of entry, so we, we have to make sure that Ayana can actually handle that. And as far as I understand, you have discussed this with Michelle to some extent. Yes, so we we've been discussing with Michelle, and she was basically also always saying, well, you know, just get the the, the, the last call. We're pretty happy with most of the things that are, are that are there, and um, we just want some some more feedback. But they're pretty happy with the things are as they are right now. So now, when you say, okay, we need to specify. A little bit more this process maybe there will be a, little, a couple of questions popping up from coming, coming back from michelle to, to say okay how do we exactly do that because she's really uh very um uh, very constructive and she really wants to to make sure that things make sense to her so no, i can see it you have a module in rfc and there's no sit file allocated what do i do all of the sudden yeah okay. yeah but it's i mean for me this is very very reasonable that could be worked out but uh, and um, if you are able to contribute some some text to to that, actually to to actually specifying the the way this behavior works, and uh, and you know make sure that we actually go and I mean also you and together we go to Michelle and and make sure that your text actually corresponds to something that she considers not a horrible nightmare but a beautiful thing. <laughs> then of course that's that's okay. Really good. Good. So uh, the the procedure will be to actually get this into the the document, 
and then get agreement from uh, Michel that this actually can be done and get the agreement from the other Michel that uh, Kumai.space actually does this and uh, great, wonderful. Great, fantastic. Okay, now that's my slide. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, so the, the, this was one of the very, very few issues that we have been discussing about uh, these uh, drafts uh, uh, that, that have been uh, sitting there uh, for quite a while. The other one was uh, whether um, a yang Sibo document should have a context dependence. And I think in Montreal we decided it should not have a context dependence. And we now have updated drafts that, that uh, uh, reflect that. And uh, the, the next thing we need to do is to finish this. Now it turns out all the, the current authors of these documents um, have a lot of uh, things to do. and. Uh, uh, so this makes it a little bit hard to actually do the finishing here. And I have a proposal um, that I hope nobody objects uh, to, uh, which is that we add an editor to the uh, CoreConf uh, documents uh, whose job is to, to get them finished. And um, so uh, I had this idea uh, at the hackathon and I looked around and, and the one person that, that uh, yeah, I, I was sitting pretty close to Ivalo at the time. So um, actually, Ivalo, if, if you hear him talking, sounds exactly like Michel. So he is like, like a really good stand-in for Michel Villette, uh, but he also knows a lot about the, all this technology. So I think he's also the right person to, to uh, do this. Um, so I'm proposing that, that uh, we add uh, Ivalo to the uh, documents as an editor. And uh, yeah, give him a chance to, to finish this. So from a procedural point of view, uh, the working group chairs can just do that. Uh, so uh, I could just declare this, but of course I would like to hear what people think about that. Um, so as an author of this draft, I, I support this because it's, it, I mean, we've been like, the little epsilon, the little delta that is really having somewhere, someone every day thinking about this, about getting this finished and not having been on two continents and stuff like this, it, it's really helpful. So I think that's, uh, uh, we, we need this type of person. And um, f f on a second perspective, uh, having no Evalu, I think that he's more than capable of doing the, getting the job done. I'm not sure if Michelle is, uh... The other Michel, the, the Michel in Canada, is uh, listening, but somebody has to break this uh, to him, and I think then we can uh, go ahead. Good. So we have uh, uh, 15 minutes left to pull things forward from Thursday. So let's do that. And the next one on the Thursday agenda is the Dev UN document. Is Yari here? Yes. Okay, so this should be brief. Um, just as a reminder, this is of course the URN types for devices with various kinds of addresses, MAC addresses and uh, one wire addresses and so forth. And we've been expanding that a little bit in recent times. Uh, version three basically had no major changes. We had some reference updates um, and we'd be going a little bit back and forth on the exact syntax um, and as part of the some of the incorporation of other uh, identifier types in into the dev urns we had added uh, the percent encoding uh, last time um, after looking at that a little bit more uh, we were making a change there again um, and dev urns are likely, are likely to appear in cnml sensor name fields which have been defined in uh, 8428 as uh, with a very limited uh, character set in order to then be able to easily be lifted out and, and used in uh, various query components. And, and basically this, this means that it's, it's not a necessarily a good idea to include person signs. So if we take that out, maybe that's, uh, that's okay. Um, 
But otherwise, this is relatively stable, as at least as, as one considers the things that are in the draft today. One could, of course, expand that, and maybe that's the dis discussion to be had now. Um, so just to uh, draw a more um, explicit point on this, um, the, the, the draft actually takes over some things that were previously in the, or are currently still in the lightweight machine-to-machine -machine specifications. Uh, there's the OS and OPS syntax for serial numbers. Um, and they're not exactly in uh, in the same format in this dra draft that they were in in the OMS spec. Um, but I think it makes sense for the IETF to sort of try and generalize like, okay, this seems like a useful thing. Let's let's make sure that's actually defined and fits with the rest of the structure syntax wise. It doesn't use the person signs and all, all kinds of other things like that. Um, so we're making a change. We're incorporating some things, um, and we have been trying to ask if if there's people who would be impacted by that. Um, we haven't found any, but I don't know if we reached everybody. So now would be a good time to shout if if uh, any of that causes heartburn for you. Uh, I should also mention that there are some other types in this uh, uh, these OMA specifications that we did not deal with, and there might be some opinions that we should deal with some of that. So th there's a couple of things um, there. They, they refer to the NAI uh, URN type that doesn't exist anywhere and nobody's defined that. Um, it felt a little bit like that's not our, um, or it's, it's not a great fit for this draft, but it might be a very useful thing perhaps to do. And then there's some, some other things that maybe, at least on last time I looked at it, may, might need some uh, slight adjustment there. There are some uh, URN types that uh, can be used for some, some of these things, like uh, maids and EMA and, and so forth. Uh, but at least on my look, the, the syntax didn't, didn't seem to be exactly correct at, at, at the spec at the time that I looked at it. Um, so I, I guess the question is, where do we stop? Like, do we stop here or do we add something? And I, you know, I'm just editing this draft. It's up to you guys to say, what should we do? So I'll, I'll leave it at that and open it up for comments. Thank you, Yari. Uh, this is Matthias uh, Siemens. Um, so there's something I contacted you, I think, two ITFs ago. So uh, the context is um, I'm active in the W3C at this Web of Things uh, working group. And um, the background is there are a lot of kind of uh, companies who don't have this detailed background in uh, internet and web technology, um, but they want to kind of uh, move there. Uh, one one thing I saw is that uh, they wanted to have something like URNs and use them, but they didn't know that uh, there is something in the beginning that basically defines how you can use them. So there was uh, things like a URN, colon, company name, and then um, a common pattern was something like the Java package names to have like an easy way to construct uh, something that is unique, but kind of intuitive and so on. Um, so what happened is that we now have a lot of drafts where we have these sloppy examples where we have like URN dev WOT. Um, I try to kind of converge this already to, to the, the patterns defined by, by your draft. Um, but I saw kind of a need for this kind of easy way to, to make up a unique uh, URNs. And I, I think we have that easy way because we have this organization and serial number and, and so on based uh, options here. So if, if, if you can, you know, um, bother yourself by registering uh, uh, an enterprise number from IANA, which would be really easy, like basically an email or, or <laughs> fill in a template, then, then you can stick that into the right branch here and then do whatever uh, afterwards. Yeah, and exactly um, this part to be aware that there is an IANA registry where every company could get this number for free and so on. Um, just to my experience is already too much for many people who do uh, their own model number, serial number kind of encoding of unique identifiers. So, okay, so is, is this something that we should solve with more education and, and sort of preaching to people or are we gonna define the whatever you are in type and then you can yeah, so, so I don't have uh, my own agenda on this, so I want to bring it up to basically get some more input how we should do this. So um, I've been going around to, to people who started doing 
using URNs, uh, especially internally in the company, and point to this draft, like pick something that works correctly, uh, use the UUID if you use UUIDs there, but don't, uh, it's, it's not a free format that you can choose. So there is definitely a need for education, but uh, maybe a good solution would also be that there is one, like pick this one if you want to be free and then to, to have something very intuitive, that, that's just a proposal. That, that might be something that would be sort of uh, uh, you know, easy to write something higher up in the document. That's like, if you're just looking for this, go into this section and use the, the, this kind of style. Might be easy to point to. Yeah, so this meta question is, um, if there is some feedback on, should we have something like the Java package name style, where you can use your own domain name that basically is unique, that's why it was chosen there, and then con construct uh, something text-based that, that fits your needs? Or, um, yeah, if you should have the, the stronger pushback and, and educate people here, do it that way, and then maybe improve the document as you suggested, that there's kind of a really three steps uh, explanation how to get it. Yeah, I don't have a strong opinion on that. I mean, we, we currently have the, the enterprise number scheme. Uh, we could certainly have, or go, I think we actually had previously, Ari, do you remember we had previously a version that, that, that used the domain names? Uh, that, that's an option too, if that, that feels like uh, more usable. But, but I, I wonder if the problem is that they, like, they're not ending up with this draft or RFC at all, and then, then it's kind of difficult for us to do anything. Or if the problem is that they don't know how to fill the IANA template. Yeah, that I don't know. It seems like they don't know about the general process, so... Yeah, maybe it helps to, to have examples in the, the document. Um, so one quick comment I would like to make about enterprise numbers is um, that in some organizations uh, it's really difficult to get control over what you are supposed to do with an enterprise number. I mean, imagine Siemens, uh, this is a big organization and then somebody has this enterprise number and are you really allowed to use this enterprise number in a specific context? That requires some work. Yeah, so I have At direct Ericsson, We take on many that. of them, multiple ones easily and even bought a company with the number five and so. Okay, yeah, maybe multiple ones, but yeah, for instance, within Siemens, it would be really hard to know like who's actually the person responsible to register this, who is then allowed to use that, what is the process to um, have some subpath under that, because like uh, there, there's the, the, the brand, then there are these different divisions, and um, kind of what I saw is that the divisions figured out how to do the domain registration, so the subdomains, that works, that's something that is established, the other thing is not, so. Point taken. So maybe that does point us to the direction of adding something that would allow uh, domain names there. Hi, uh, Padma Kumar from Nokia. Uh, we had an exchange earlier on the lightweight machine to machine. So basically on the NAI and EMEA, IME, IMSI, et cetera, these combinations are all used under the lightweight M2MTS under the assumption that these are device identifiers. So it's like a URN the needs which are being brought in by different operators so there is an so it is used within the network and under the urn colon dev with this kind of identifier like ime imz so so my understanding is that the the, the spec uh, refers to multiple urn types like the dev urn is is one of them but there's also others like uuid and and, and so on yeah and yeah. um and then the only question like there's no question about that and that that seems very sensible and 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 so on but uh but then there's some that haven't been defined um which like you know, need to f either fall into this draft that we're discussing here or some other draft somewhere and and some that like might need some small editing in the in the spec because they're pointing to the like the string is wrong that that you stick in front of the identifier um and and because this be defined by 3gpp and other rfc's in the itf previously like all oh, like this mc stuff and so on yeah, I, I agree to that. I mean, some of this should needs to be added, but in the context of this uh, URN colon div, can we extend URN colon div with all these what are part of that network and it's a device identifier? So it could be like an NAI or it could be anything what that network would like to use beyond that URN colon div. Then it becomes like a unique identifier within that uh, uh, network zone. Um, 
because like for example like imi or imz is brought in from the sim card and it's used within the network but it's a device identifier when it is an iot network device okay, but we already have uh, some of those things already exist as as different urn types i'm not sure we want to sort of redefine that 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 would seem a little you know maybe i don't know, I don't know what people here say but uh yeah it's a, um, so one is in the context of network access and the other now we are trying to define in the terms of it's a device you are in so it's a iot context so that's where somewhere it has a common part but uh, it's it so, so uh, again i'm just editing this thing you guys tell me what to do my personal opinion is that uh, we should probably not mix the fact that we are doing iot uh, with that sort of the identifiers we like we have different types of identifiers and we use them for different purposes sometimes it's an iot device sometimes it's something else um, so let's just define all the all the ones you know possibly in one or multiple urn types but we shouldn't necessarily try and do everything under the dev urn that seems um personally uh, overkill but but then there's like the question of the nai which you and i discussed like what to do with that should we have somebody else drive a draft on that or stick it in here or forget it or yeah probably we'll take it offline uh, but in in terms of what is part of dev uh, identifier and urn i think it all should come here and if it doesn't fit then it cannot be used that should be the suggestion or recommendation from this final outcome Uh, okay, Ryan, um, I think we have already quite a few non-dev URN uh, IDs that we are using for devices, so I don't see it necessarily a big problem, and redefining existing URN schemes under dev URN sounds a bit flaky, probably would end up people using both, and they would have to do <laughs> exactly so. Um, Maybe it's a bit of a, it's, it's, I said we have a discussion outside the scope of this draft. Uh, what is a proper uh, <coughs> identifier for a device in general? Are network identifiers proper, proper identifiers? My hunch is why not? But maybe that's a bit bigger discussion, maybe even Archie's area. Matthias, so yeah, I think there might be an informal document about that that explains what are your ends and how to use that. and. Uh, I mean, it doesn't help that there's a dev in there and then you know, ah, this is to identify a device because it's kind of at two different levels where you decide kind of what is using the identifiers and then you only need unique ones and it doesn't have to be in the identifier itself for what you are using it. I think that that, that would make a great research group doc document, identifiers and identities in the IoT. I mean, you could derive 10 PhDs uh, about that. Mm -hmm. I would actually give some credit for the, the uh, lightweight M2M uh, document on that that regard. I mean, they, they actually tried to like identify that these are the things that we need in the industry. And uh, I mean, the, the only problem with that is, is that, okay, it shouldn't point to things that don't exist. <laughs> if they don't exist, we should either get rid of them or define them. So we have uh, three minutes left, uh, which is great because I promised somebody that he would have time on the agenda uh, today. Uh, Abhijan, are you still there? So we, we have been discussing um, interesting things you might be using Coop for. And th there are a lot of people out there in the operational area that want to use Coop for telemetry for, for network management uh, information. Uh, so that's interesting. And here we have another interesting thing using uh, Coop for uh, streaming. So you have three minutes, you probably can uh, extend beyond the end of the meeting, which is just that people will start uh, leaving. And you have a microphone there. Um, hello, everyone. So let me just briefly go through the use case. Yeah, so uh, we were working on a real business problem. The problem was that uh, in many cases, people want to stream the live first person view over internet, over IP, um, to do certain intelligence for, for operations in warehouse or for some monitoring or for uh, 
defining the path that a dumb robotic terminal should take remotely. So that is called visual slam. So visual simultaneous localization and mapping. So uh, now the thing is that um, the experience is the existing technologies that are used for streaming um, causes certain kind of, uh, I mean, video freezes and lots of problems ha happen because of uh, non-real-timeness and uh, uh, non-guarantee in delivery and all these things. So um, when this problem came to us, we kind of looked back into QAP and what we realized is that probably we can look at QAP from this angle also. So one side we have HTTP on TCP and that is the de facto standard right now for streaming over the public internet, right? Uh, uh, the, some, some or other variation using adaptive bit rate on top of that. But the core thing is HTTP uh, handshakes, right? So we have restfulness, standardized APIs, we have reliability in there, we have wide adaption, we have congestion avoidance. On the other side, if you look at the initial days since the beginning of this uh, millennia, so we had this RTP on UDP, which guarantees real-timeness, but reliability is missing. Now, if we combine these two, we see that uh, Coop is restful, Coop has both the options, so you can change between optionally, between reliability, uh, reliable delivery and based effort delivery. And um, uh, because no response actually gives you the open loop delivery. So we have we can marry the best of these two worlds using Coab intelligently. Um, so the idea is that can we have something that is equally good in sending small sensor data as well as streaming uh, video or a time series streaming? Can we have something like a counterpart of HTTP? So HTTP is while it is giving you web services, normal web services, at the same time, it is not treating video as a, a special uh, uh, special type of data, and it is streaming video with the same infrastructure. So can we have something for this scenario? Because in many cases, the dump terminals th which are uh, uh, moving around across warehouses or in different fields, or for some remote maintenance, they are also sending some small tiny sensor data as well, as well as they're sending uh, the first person view so that the person sitting at the control room can uh, do something. So uh, I'll not go through much detail because to honor the time. Uh, so we made certain extensions. I'll directly go to the results and experiments. You please go through the draft if you are interested. These are few headed extensions that we have kind of borrowed because we want to relate the segment so it is it, it is following the same uh, methodology as the progressive download or, or uh, for what we had for http streaming the basic technology that is the same thing we are using so chunk and what we are doing here is that based on the criticality of the current chunk what is the criticality of the segment that is being delivered does it transfer certain important metadata or there may be several other criteria, and that depends on the context. We are deciding whether to go for best uh, best effort delivery or whether to go for reliable delivery. So that way, we can maintain a balance between your <laughs> reliable delivery and real timeness, right? And the other thing is that if your receiving end does have enough ca computing capacity, so you have hundred percent reliable met, uh, the metadata and critical information. And based on the loss probability of the channel, you have certain part of the critical, uh, non-critical information. Combining these two, you can actually predict the whole frame. So uh, that technology is available. And many people who are working on image processing and video processing are actually using that. <clears throat> uh, and also, if you are not able to send the critical information, drop the whole frame. So that way, you are implicitly congestion, uh, you are uh, avoiding the congestion uh, implicitly. Uh, we did certain, these are the handshakes, you will find them in, okay, so this is this was our uh, setup. So uh, one thing we did is for open internet for different loss probabilities. So we had uh, Raspberry Pis where we installed the program. So one had HTTP streaming, one had ADList, and this guy was sitting at this end. 
is working with me and we're streaming this over an emulated network setup and we're trying to get the uh, data on three different interfaces here over Wireshark. And there was another thing was we tried to create a realistic loss model. So there is an, a, a, an EAV moving around uh, a work, uh, a, a warehouse and there is a obstruction, radio obstruction, which is creating some shadowed area. And what, as, and probably for three seconds, it, it takes to cover this area for two or three seconds. And we're getting a, a radio, I mean, zero radio zone over there. So just to come with this, so this is what we're getting is very ex excellent result. Uh, using uh, uh, by streaming in on Quab. So one thing to uh, and we compared with RTP as well. We, I'm, I have not produced the result. RTP is not giving us good PSNR because of the reason that if the metadata gets lost, you, you have no mechanism to retrieve it. But in case of Quab, you have some chances of retrieving the meta. So we are getting better sanity in terms of reception of frames and in terms of reception of, uh, or in terms of reproducing the frames at the uh, receiving end. And this is also another experiment that we did with real APs, the mobile APs that we have in India. So, uh, so this is the topology and this guy is holding the AP. It is close to the uh, uh, Raspberry Pis. And now this guy is moving out. So as he's moving across the region, what we have is a drop in the RSSI, receive signal strength. And what we see is that when it is in this region, there the HTTP stream or the standard streaming mechanism, it, it kind of freezes at that point of time. And then when this guy starts to move back to the same place, uh, and we were actually holding a stopwatch. Uh, I mean, I was holding the stopwatch. And uh, so, and we are recording the time. What is the time that is being, uh, streamed to from the pro video producer to video consumer. So when this guy comes back and I, so now the signal has actually gone back to this level. What I see is that in, in case of what we did uh, over Quap, we see that the consumer is showing just the exact time what we are showing. So there was momentary loss because the signal just dropped down. So there is a zero radio kind of thing but it quickly recovered back, right? Whereas here we see a complete six second lag uh, within this period of time. And if I have more loss instances over there, these six seconds will get increased. Uh, if I use RTP, then what will happen is I lose, I lose more of the frames. In this case, we just work with uh, JPEG streaming, uh, one of the reason for, or motion JPEG, one of the reason for using motion JPEG uh, is that we wanted to avoid the complexity of uh, uh, time compression in this case. And the other thing is that in many cases to take the decision, the decision logic uses the information in a frame. So they have to reconstruct the frame and do the image processing to extract the information. So if I'm transmit the motion JPEG, maybe I'm not at that high uh, frame rate. Maybe I'm, in this case, we sent, I think five or six frames per second. But that was when we spoke to the engineering team who are working on drone, they said that it is quite good for them to, I mean, uh, do a survey or do a scanning or things like that. So I request you to please go through the draft and if you have any comments and what I think is that this, kind of work will go well with the uh, too many responses and uh, some of the streaming or time series related contributions that are going on in T2TRG as well as in this working group. And that's it from my side. Thank you. T is waiting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think it's really interesting. There are ways uh, can be used that I wouldn't have dreamed of. And um, I think we we, um, we probably have the research group where we can look at some some of these um, aspects as well. Um, and um, I think we should uh, f find how these uh, customers from management from from this is not exactly video; it's a slightly different kind of video. But uh, how how they actually fit into our ecosystem and and 
We had the dots people here the, the last time. Um, and I think this is uh, all very interesting and very promising. And I would ask you to have a look at, at the document that uh, is out in the Internet Routes directory um, and uh, uh, look there for more details. So uh, with this, I think we're at the end of the, the meeting and uh, see you all on Thursday. Thank you all.